Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive, Daniel here. All right, tonight I'm going to be taking a look at Machina Arcana, the second edition. So right off the bat, I just want to say that this is a very good game. I do have some issues with it, uh, and a lot of those stem unfortunately from the rulebook, which tends to be kind of a broken record I'm always on a dead horse I'm always beating, but uh, the rule book has some issues. All of the rules are there, but they are presented in a way that can be quite challenging to grasp all of the concepts in the game. So we'll get on to that um, as we go through and look at the game and and review it. So. Machina Arcana is a, it's a steampunk Lovecraftian dungeon crawl adventure game set in this very alien and bizarre kind of mountain fortress. Uh, I think of it kind of like a, like a steampunk at the mountains of madness or something like that. And it deals with these explorers who are going in to this mountain base looking for evidence of this cult. Um, and this cult has been doing these just absolutely terrible things. And the explorers need to find out what is going on and put a stop to all of the evil that the cult is doing. So it's a really cool premise. It It is Lovecraftian, but it doesn't feel really anything like the FFG um, Lovecraft Mythos games or Cthulhu Death May Die. It really does have its own unique take on the mythos, not just so much in the story and theme, but in the way that the game plays and in the way its mechanisms are so closely tied into the theme. And that's one of the reasons why I think the game can be a little difficult to learn in addition to some very oddly worded phrases and some, some elements of the rulebook being unorganized. There is, there's this, uh, this integration of theme and mechanism in this game that does, I think, make it a difficult game to, to teach on paper because the game itself really isn't difficult. It's not a complex game, but there are a lot of you know, like interwoven mechanisms that you have to work through in order to really get it. But once you do, things really start to flow and the game can be a lot of fun and offer up a lot of really unique situations that you have to deal with. Cool loot, tons of great loot, neat um, like non-combat, really cinematic events that happen, and a pretty interesting story. So I, I wanna start off with the review by just doing a, a, a quick little comparison between some of the components that came in the first edition and some of the components that came in the second edition. Now, the second edition is not a huge reworking of the game. I will say most of the changes are cosmetic, and I believe that all of the cosmetic changes are for the better. During the Kickstarter campaign, of which I was a backer for this, uh, I was a little disappointed with the new art direction. During the campaign, I didn't think it looked very interesting. It looked slightly better art than the first edition, but not quite as, as bold. But once I got the game in person, uh, I no longer had those feelings. I still really like the look of the first edition. So let's take a look at some of that right now. So let's take a look at some of the enemy cards. So we have three enemies. These are from the first edition. We have a Sorol, a Gug, and a C'Thun. And you can guys already tell, for those of you who have watched the Dungeon Dive for any period of time, probably go, oh, okay, yeah, 
Daniel is going to like uh, this art. <laughs> it's bold. It's line art. It's monotone. I like this kind of look. They went for a very different, a far more colorful look in the new edition, but I think it works. And so let's take a look at these three monsters I actually have um, set up on the board right now. So they're corresponding cards between the first and second edition. Now the cards are, the monster cards are slightly bigger. Nope, they are the same exact size. So most of the components are exactly uh, the same size and most of them do feature the same stats. So we have armor, we have will, that protects against physical damage, that protects against psychic damage, and then you have their health and how much stamina they use. Stamina is the kind of the overriding currency in this game that both monsters and the explorers used to uh, activate their abilities and take actions. So you can see uh, I, I, the, the new art is really quite nice. It still has a nice character to it. During the Kickstarter campaign, it looked a little bit more like it was just like more colorful, better art, something more like an FFG presentation of these kind of weird otherworldly creatures. But I think it's much better than that. It still has that really creepy look to it. Okay, and then we have the Gug here. So here's the Gug comparison. Now he's quite a bit different looking. But as you can see, all the stats are the same. 4, 4, 3, 3, 2, 2, 5, 5. And their abilities are the same as well. Uh, the Gug, what he wants to do is he wants to just go around the map and destroy um, beneficial spaces that the heroes can use. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, we have the Sorol here, who looks very different. I actually really like the original drawing of this quite a bit better. I think it, it's far more evocative. Okay, and then let's take a look at the comparison between the Explorer cards here. So again, here's first edition. Uh, the explorers I'm playing with are Lorai and Jesse. And then there are their second edition counterparts. Really nice colors. One of the things that the second edition does is it really amps up the color, but not in a cartoony way. It more like just amps up the saturation. So I ended up really liking these a lot. I still do, of course, like this kind of older look to it. I think it just, it reminds me of a more like a, a more old uh, kind of old school game. And then another big part of this game is actually working through a narrative story and you're working through chapters. And the original game or uh, the first edition the chapter cards were the same size as all the other cards. And as you work through this game, you're gonna be flipping them over and you're gonna get a picture on the back of the first card that corresponds with the text of the chapter you're playing. And so then as you work through that, you're always gonna have just a nice little piece of art to look at, which is really cool. That was a really neat concept that I would like to see in more games. It does give you a visual and a narrative component to uh, wrap your mind around. And the second edition makes that even better by greatly expanding the size of the cards. And so, I mean, they're more than, more than double the size and so you get some really nice art and they're just able to display some of the mechanisms a little more clearly. The writing, the, the theme text is mostly the same. Uh, I guess it's a, there's a couple spots I think I've noticed some differences, but for the most part, it is the same. But right now with this, I am about halfway through this chapter. And we'll talk about this chapter in a minute. And then one of the other things that changed are the standees. 
so the original standees, of course, were uh, they had the black and white art, and they were had this really heavy linen finish. The new cards, the new ones, do not have that really heavy linen finish, so you don't get the uh, the kind of the uh, lines that kind of break up the art a little bit. So I really like these. They have kind of a matte finish to them. You can see they're not quite as shiny, and I really like that. The, uh, the standees are absolutely beautiful. And then the monster standees, I really liked these. They was, these were far more something, like something out of uh, Cave Evil or Cryptic Explorers or something. And their new cards, of course, have uh, the different colored picture on there. And also, there are four different levels of enemy in this game. And with the new edition, as the enemies get stronger, their um, their standees get bigger. So it's kind of a nice visual representation of the monsters getting stronger. So we have a first level, then a second level, a third level, and a fourth level monster. So that is also uh, quite a nice touch there. And then let's see, what are the different, some other differences here? We have a uh, the player board really nice new player board you have this double layer and you can keep track of your stats with different tokens so you have essence you have health and stamina again stamina is a currency that you spend to take actions on your turn health self-explanatory gets down to zero you die something new that does happen in second edition when a explorer dies they are out of the game and then they start controlling the monsters and they're able to use the monsters in a little more of an intelligent way than the basic AI. And then you put your, uh, you know, you put your Explorer card there. And then Essence is the third stat. And Essence is another currency that you can build during the game. And you can use it, you can spend it to do different beneficial things. Um, one other change was the chapter board. So the old chapter board, you had your chapter cards here and you had to keep track of different stats here and they didn't have any names. So I actually wrote on mine to, t to remind me what they were. That was one of the problems with the first edition was like, it was just, uh, there were quite a few things that were difficult to discern through the graphic design of the game. And that's one of the things that, that I think he's changed the designer has made a little better in this game as the graphic design and the chapter board i gotta be careful with the new one of course is has bigger spaces for the chapter cards it too is double uh, layered so you can use these little tokens to keep track of your monster level your monster threat as the threat goes up and it fills up the track then the level of the monsters you're facing goes up and then you have a spawn track and a horror rating track. Uh, you roll against those. If you roll higher than the track level, you either spawn a monster or draw a horror card. If you don't roll higher, you, um, you lower the value by one. So the next time you have a greater chance of spawning a monster or a um, horror event. And then finally, let's take a quick look at the tiles. So most of the tiles are the same. There are new tiles in this game, but what they've done is they've slightly increased the, I would say, they've made the colors a little more vibrant. Um, they're a little more, they're just they're, they're they're not really brighter i guess they are a little bit brighter but they are more colorful but they don't look cartoony um this isn't kind of a this isn't like a difference between you know diablo 2 and diablo 3. they're just they're, they're the colors are more saturated in the new version and i think it goes a long way of really making things pop and that is important because there is a lot going on on the tiles that you play the game on. And that's one of the things that I think makes this game so interesting and so fun to play is the, the ability that you have, the, the all the different things you can do while you're moving your character 
around this tile. So oftentimes you're going to start the game, you're going to start at one of the entrances at the tile, and you can move in any direction. So that's one of the things, one of the big things that they changed in second edition is they simplified diagonal movement. So you could always move diagonal if you had nothing blocking any of the corners or blocking both corners. But now you can move diagonal um, through objects. You can nothing can block you diagonal. So if you had if you were here and you had um, monsters here and here in the first edition, you could not move diagonal through those monsters to this space. But now you can. And this game has such a tight, um, it's such a tight uh, economy of movement points, of, of, of ability points, of, of stamina, that just that simple um, act of simplifying diagonal movement really opens up a lot of a greater variety of choices you have on each of your turns because you don't have to spend so much stamina moving around different elements on the tiles. Because a lot of the tiles are actually like really wide open. So you can see two different, uh, very two different tiles here. This one is all like, so these are walls here. And this is all like very comp, you know, very a complex, like a maze. You have doors here and you're moving around in these little tight corridors. Doors in this game always start open and then you can spend stamina to close the door and you could represent by these little tokens. And when the doors are closed, you can open them again or monsters can try to destroy them. But then this tile here is just wide open. There's hardly any walls, only along the edges here. And this is one area here where the diagonal movement just opens up this tile in more, in just in interesting ways, because you can move here and then you can move diagonal through these obstacles, and you used to not be able to do that. So I really like the new diagonal movement. I know that sounds silly, but it's a really simple design change that I think makes the game a lot more fun. And what it does most of all is it makes the game faster because this game can be a little slow. It can take quite a bit of time to move through an entire story, but by allowing you to do more things on your turn, it does make the game go faster. So on the board, each of these tiles is double-sided and there are quite a few of them. I think there's like eight or so, maybe 10, but each one is gonna have a number of different elements that you can interact with. We have these event spaces here. So these are good spaces. You can move your explorer up to one of these spaces and then you can trigger a explorer event. So this is a whole deck of cards. There are like 30 generic cards that you play with on every scenario. And then each scenario has its own cards that you add to the deck. And you're gonna add the ones that have the scenario icon there. But these are all beneficial things that you can spend stamina on to trigger. And they're gonna give you different abilities that you can use. So this one will allow somebody to spend three stamina to increase armor by two. And every single one of these cards is a good thing that can happen. So you can choose to activate that space for something good to happen. Those are offset by what I mentioned earlier when we looked at the chapter board, the horror rating. If you roll to have a horror event, then these are negative cards and these can impact, these will all impact you in very negative ways. And so they all have some really good writing. I think the writing in this game is excellent. It is, especially outside of the rule book. That's why I'm, I really wonder why some of the passages in the rule book are so poorly worded because the wording in the flavor text, which is written by the same, which I believe it's all written by the designer, is really, really good. So there's this weird discrepancy between the thematic written elements and the documentation of the game. Okay, but then next we have these trap levers. So this is a really cool thing in this game. These trap levers can be activated for a certain number of stamina. And then these spaces that look like grates, 
any unit, be it an explorer or a monster, that's on any of these great tiles gets attacked by three strong dice. And attacking works really easily. You have a um, you have an armor value. So let's say the monster had an armor value of three. Yeah, let's say like this Gug here has an armor value of four. And this Gug is on this trap space for two stamina. A hero who's standing there, there, or there could trigger this trap, thus attacking that Gug for three black dice. And if the pips add up to its armor or more, so in this case, it would hit and it does one damage. All attacks in this game are basically the same. You roll three dice, either in a combination, or not, you roll your dice, it's not always three, but you have strong dice and weak dice. You add up the pips. If the pips are equal to or greater than the armor class, then they take one point of damage. Very simple combat. The enemies don't have a ton of health, so you're not just sitting there wailing on them turn after turn. Most of the time, you're going to be able to take out an enemy in one or two turns. You just you really have to think the strategy and the tactical decision, decisions in this game come in, the, in how you spend your stamina wisely. So another spot you have here is a workbench. A workbench allows you to draw items from the various item decks and then mix the or substitute items that you have equipped with those new items and also keep one new item and trade items with an adjacent explorer or give items to an adjacent explorer. The workbench is a super powerful tool to be used. It costs three stamina, so it's a high stamina cost uh, spot to use, but it gives you a lot of benefits. And another big change they did in this game is they broke out the loot into four different decks. So you have apparel, you have like weapons and items, you have artifacts and you have consumables. Anytime you are told to draw an item, you can pick which deck you want to choose from. So you can go more for weapons and augmentations to your weapons. You can go more for armor. You can go more for um, artifacts, which give you certain bonuses or consumables, which are like grenades and health potions and that kind of thing. And there are three different levels of, of um, items, one, two, and three. You can see this is a level two, this is a level three. And so this is a, this is a, um, a level two weapon, the sacrificial Karis, and it costs two stamina to use. It's a melee weapon and you attack with two white die. And then when adjacent monster dies, restore one health to any explorer on your map tile. So that's a really cool, that's a weapon that it's like a, it drains the life energy. Okay, and then you have these boots here. Now boots, different pieces of armor of apparel, they can add to your stats, you, they can add armor to your or to your willpower, and they can also be combined. So this is a torso armor, and as you can see, these symbols match. So you can add these boots to that torso armor. So now you have this as your armor set, and then there are also. Let's see if I can find a. Uh, let's see if I can find like a helmet. Yep. So this game kind of has like fashion souls capability where you can mix and match pieces of armor to make cool looking and, and armor with cool abilities. And so this would be a set of armor. And then torsos can be augmented by different um, elements. Let's see if I can find a torso augmentation item. Let's see here. Yeah, so like anything that has on this left hand side, this symbol, that can also be added to a torso. So this would give you a grappling capability with these boots and then this helmet. So you've put together this really interesting piece of armor and the workshop helps you do that because it helps you, you know, cycle through uh, some of the items to find items that you want. Additionally, you also have this treasure chest and that you can open and you can take two items from any deck and choose one and to keep. You have these recharge stations where you can use those to gain a point of stamina or a point of health. These are spawn places 
These are where the enemies come out when they spawn. You can destroy those to prevent enemies from coming out onto the board. These are exploding barrels. Whenever they are shot, attacked, or if you push a monster or pull a monster or a, an explorer into them, they are like a trap space. They attack all adjacent units. And then finally, and probably most importantly, you have these chapter spaces. And these have to be interacted with, they have to be lit up like a beacon, and then interacted with in order to progress to the next chapter of the scenario. And so if you did that on a turn, then you would progress to the next chapter. And there are some chapters are what they call blocking chapters which I can find one right here. So if the chapter has this symbol, the way you progress through that is by doing something according to the rules on the chapter card itself. So they're kind of like little side quests built in to the story that you are progressing through. So if you, if you can't tell, there is, a, there, there is just a, a ton to this game. Uh, it's really interesting and fascinating. And if you look over here, I'll kind of show you, I, I kind of ended my uh, game here at an interesting point to kind of show you how things can progress, how things can change, how dynamic the world can be. So I'm on this tile here. Now you can explore two other tiles leading out. I just had just started this new, ch this new chapter uh, after taking a rest. So I came on to this one new area of the cultist's mountain fortress. And so as I explore, I could add a tile up here or a tile to the side. And you can have a, four by, a two by two area to work through. And then you can continue to explore and anything that's left, anything that gets greater than two by two gets pulled off. So it's kind of like a scrolling element in like a video game or something. However, okay, so here we have Jesse. He's over here. We have Lori over here. Now what I did is I moved Lori up to here next to this trap lever. And I moved Jesse here and I used him as bait to draw these enemies out because all of these spaces in this corridor are trap spaces. So I wanted Lori on her turn to trigger this lever and then attack everything in this hallway basically for three. Yes, even Jesse, but Jesse has enough armor that he could probably withstand the attack. So that's what I did. I set up that turn and then the monsters move. So they, the, all the monsters are moving towards Jesse. This monster here, the Cthune, it stays, it's immobile. It's like a healing thing. So it will heal monsters on its turn. The Gug, all it wants to do is it wants to go through the map and it wants to destroy those beneficial spaces. And so it's like over here in this room, just like like a crazy uh, toddler Hulk going on a rampage, just destroying things. And when something gets destroyed, you put one of these uh, markers on it so that can no longer be used. But anyway, so I was going to set up this trap for these enemies, but then I failed my horror rating, so I had, <laughs> I had to draw this card here, Revitalizing Poison. Watch in the dark as they rest. Their vigor returns like a bird to nest. Their vigor restored, their guard is down. Pounce on them now, wear their flesh as a gown. You take a drink and then you die. You feel all right, but tis a lie. And this card is terrible for my plan because this card is gonna trigger three times. Whenever an explorer restores essence, all explorers on the map tile are attacked for three, an arcane attack. It's like a psychic attack. Well, you gain any time you destroy a monster, you gain essence. And so I wanted her to be, to take out these two uh, enemies with that trap. But if I do that, both of these are gonna die. And then all of the explorers, both Jesse and Lori, are going to be attacked by three black dice. Uh, a very strong psychic attack. So it's like, oh my, I had this great plan, but then the machinations in this 
terrible, terrible place in this Machina Arcana. They are working against you always. So things can go south in this game really quickly. You're, you're constantly having to, to, you can plan and you can often execute those plans, but, but you also are constantly having to think on the fly and change up your tactics to, uh, you know, to correspond with what the game is throwing at you. It's, it, it's a very, very fun game. I wish, wish, however, that the rule book was just better written. Like I said, all of the rules are here, okay? Nothing is left out, but it is made difficult by a number of reasons. One being that this game uses some different terminology for things that are common to other games in this genre. For example, an attack isn't an action. It's a, it's a unit effect. Um, things aren't just called actions. Um, your abilities are either owned or not owned. Your, uh, your abilities have multiple effects. You use an ability to generate its effect. There is a reason why all of those things exist. It's not, he didn't just, the designer didn't just change terms to make his game sound different. Like I said at the beginning of this video, there are a lot of elements in this game that are intertwined. And so it makes sense, but you do have to get through the rule book to really understand. And you have to just, you just kind of have to think about things, but the, some of the wording makes things way more difficult than it needs to be. And page 24 is a great example. So this is talking about targeting. Okay. So targeting is a concept that we have in a lot of these games. It's not a new concept. And it's talking about how there are different kinds of targeting. If, if you use an ability that has a certain target, then that target has to be valid. If the target isn't expressly stated, then it is assumed that anything on the map can be used as that target. But so this, like this uh, ability, this paragraph here, map tile scope. An ability can have either the owner or the activating unit. If those abilities don't require a target, their default scope is the current map tile. That first, an, an ability, so an ability is something on a card that, uh, so this is an ability that costs three stamina. You, it's a melee attack, that's the ability. And then this is the effect of that ability. You would attack for two black dice and one white. And then afterwards you roll a D10. And if you roll a six or higher, the target is immobile for one turn. Okay, so this is saying though that an ability can have either the owner or the activating unit. It sounds like something is missing from that sentence. It sounds like it's a whole part of that sentence is missing, but it's really not. What that is actually saying is that an owner, a monster, a unit, a explorer can have an ability or they can own it or the ability can be triggered by an activating unit. And the distinction between those two is not, it's, it's explained there, but it's not explained very clearly. And it does make sense once you wrap your hand around the wording. Uh, and here's another, so like uh, this others. Uh, we saw how the default scope of ability that doesn't require a target is the map tile if it has either the owner or the activating unit. <laughs> So it's just, it's, it's really weird to me because like, like I said, the writing in, in, in the text is really good in the, in the thematic text, like uh, return to the base at last, fresh, cold air, how soothing and clean. We have left the horrors of that place behind us for the moment, but I know that we must return here and soon we must put an end to whatever is happening inside that awful mountain. Something perverse and disastrous is being prepared there. I can feel it. I mean, that's really good. That's really evocative. And, and it's, it's, uh, the game is, is full of really great writing like that and all of its thematic elements, but the documentation, the rules are, 
they take some time. So if you get this game, and I know there's quite a few people who are struggling, who are bouncing off, just read the rule book a couple times, watch the um, bits of board playthrough. He does a really good job of showing a, a few turns and then come back and read the rules again while you're playing and things will start to make sense. Um, so for me, I made these little cheat sheets that have all of the different actions you can take with their cost and the page number that you can find those on. Uh, this I believe is on BGG and I find this very useful because there's really not a spot in the game in the manual that lists all of the actions and that's because the actions really are super tied in with other things and that's what I'm saying there's like this game is like a tentacle a knot of tentacles where all of its mechanisms are tangled up together and so that is you know just something you have to think about and then the designer did finally make this two page um, player aid that is also very useful to grasp the game. But I really like this game. I think this game is fantastic. I'm having a blast playing it. I'm playing through the first chapter. There are, in the Kickstarter version, there is, a, so there's one, two, three, four. There are five chapters. They're very long. Uh, there are a ton, like I said, a absolute ton of um, items. I mean, here's your deck of like apparel that you can get, your deck of weapons and augmentations. So yeah, I mean, you're exploring a lot. You're putting together items, you're putting together weapons. Weapons can be augmented too. So Jesse right now has this gun, this despawner gun, and I attach this spectral reflector to it, which is like this light, which allows me to target um, ethereal units like ghosts so now i'm like this ghost hunting explorer working through this uh crazy world uh you have all the different monsters there are a lot of different monsters and they all have really nice art i believe there's uh so this is like levels one and two and then there's like levels three and four here i got a king in yellow looking dude there a dole a spawn of cthulhu but yeah, lots of really, uh, I love the, the, the Shogoth picture on this thing. It's just amazing. And there are quite a few different explorers. Four of the explorers that came with the Kickstarter are kind of advanced explorers. They have some extra rules. Two of them have these like alternate egos, these persona-like things that they can change into somehow. And then you have like the regular units. So yeah, this, uh, this is a good game. Just give it some time if you're struggling. Uh, the designer is answering all kinds of questions. Just know that all the rules are here. Everything you need to play the game is here. The back of the manual does have some clarification and a nice little index of game effects. But just know that you're gonna have to spend some time kind of interpreting the way this game works through the like the brain through your brain and kind of reconciling it with the way you think about other games because it, it is even though it's using a lot of the same mechanisms and the same kind of um, ideas it is doing some different interesting things in how everything is intertwined so like ultimately my review of this game can be stated in a single sentence it is a, re a rewarding frustration but it's not so bad not even close to something like skull tales where it's like unplayable where parts of the game are unplayable it's not even close to that it just it takes some time and you are going to be frustrated before it clicks but once it clicks I really think, I, I can't imagine anybody who likes dungeon crawls and adventure games not liking this game. This game has a ton to offer and I tried to show all of those things briefly and how they can in, be incorporated into the game to give you all kinds of variety and different things to explore and make, create in different ways. It, it, it's also a very challenging game. Uh, you will you will die a lot it's because you really have to think about how you spend your stamina smartly to 
progress through the chapters doing the right things at the right time. So yeah, that was Machina Arcana. Thanks for watching. I know this was a super long review. I'm sorry. Oh my God, 40 minutes. Uh, I didn't expect it to be that long. I was trying to do this in 20 and I completely failed. So uh, <laughs> well, enjoy the long video. For those of you who do, I know some people hate them. Some people like them. But highly recommend this game. It's thematic. It's dark. It's got that cool steampunk thing going on. It's got lots of stuff that you will that will entice you and that will thrill you. So, all right, guys. Well, take it easy, and we'll talk to you later. Bye, bye.